Hi, I'm Amy, and today I am joined by the absolutely wonderful author of Bloody Fool for Love, um, William Ritter. Um, as soon as I started reading this book, I was like, I need to find a way to get hold of this author because it is so good. I was desperate to talk about it. Um, so thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's delightful to be here. Um, I'm really excited to chat Buffy books with you. But first, um, can you tell us a little bit about this Buffy book, which is so exciting you got to write it, um, your Buffy book. Oh, and yeah. it's right there. Let me copy back here. Uh, yeah, so Bloody Fool for Love, I got a chance to play with Spike primarily, as well as Drusilla and Darla in, uh, in sort of in their prime back when they were still running around the world being awful monsters. Uh, so this takes place just after Angel has left the group for those who are, are Buffy fans and know the, the basic storyline. Uh, he's gotten his soul back and run off and become a softie uh, and the three of them are still causing mayhem as eventually they'll, they'll sort of drift apart and they'll bump into each other again once or twice before eventually meeting 100 years later in, in Sunnydale. Uh, so this is a story in which Spike gets to sort of prove his, his love for Drusilla as, as he's often constantly trying to do. Uh, and he does so in the most bumbling, terrible ways that Spike often does. He gets to be uh, cool and tough in the ways that we're used to seeing, and also uh, absolutely Spike tripping over flower pots and making making a mess of it along the way. So it's a uh, turn of the century caper. He's uh, he eventually ends up on a big old heist, uh, fighting with with monsters and things in Victorian London. I love that. It did feel very Spike, like very accidental. Like every bit of the plot is just he falls into this situation. Okay, I'll deal with this one. Oh, and another one. Um, did you come up with a title? Because I love it. It was awesome. I, yeah, we bounced a, a big handful of titles. Uh, I'm I'm terrible with names because I, I take them too seriously and I want them to be perfect. Uh, so I had probably 20 different titles at one point. Uh, that one uh, ultimately was a, an homage, of course, to the episode Fool for Love, which, yes. uh, which is where most of the source material comes from. Uh, and then just that little, that little touch of Spike's voice in it as well. Uh, I'm, I'm happy with that. I think uh, ultimately Brittany Rubiano, who's my editor, was was the final choice to say, no, stop stop changing your mind. This one was good. Let's stick with this one. Yeah, that was the same as me and my agent. I had these all like convoluted things to try and capture everything about the book in this one title. And she went, just went, why not Mina and the? I was like, okay, yeah, let's do that. Um, yeah, done. Lucky me. Um, I wasn't yeah. suggesting we'd be all right with bloody in the title, but apparently we don't, we don't care about swears in England. It's only swears in America that matter. Yeah, I mean... I think the nice thing with Bloody is it's just got that playful vampire element, so you probably get away with it. Like, if my son said Bloody, I'd be like, nope. But, right. yes. but you know, on the cover of a book, I think has a little, like, nod. And we know that Spike talks that way, so it's fine. When I show him Buffy, I'll prep him that you yes. kind of watch Spike, but don't talk or behave like him. I had a, a delightful conversation. Uh, one of my dear friends was a, a professor at the, at the U of O named Ben Saunders. Grew up in England, and, you know, he's he's been living here for years, but... Uh, uh, still has a you know, very pronounced accent. He's, he's still very proud of his heritage. Welsh, really originally. Uh, and so when I was going over the book, I got notes back. The last, the, the copy edits were saying, oh, you know, you can't use this word. You can't use, you know, you can't call somebody a, a bugger. That's a reference to sodomy. And I said, well, no, like, I mean, yeah, technically, but no, like this, this is, this is common enough. Right? And so I checked in with Ben and this is a college professor. He's, he's decorated. He's, he, he's, he's done all kinds of inter interviews for television and things. Very important man. Uh, and so rather than talking to him about important literature, it was here are all the swears that I've got. Tell me like, like, and he's like, Oh, my mother called me bugger all the time. I think we're good with that one. Things like that. So uh, it was, it was fun talking British swears with, uh, with original sources. Yeah. You're like James Masters in that regard, because I didn't realize that he wasn't British until I got the Buffy game, which I don't know whether you've played that chaos bleeds. No. And they showed an interview with him as a additional material and I was like hang on that's an American accent and I was why is he again. doing an American accent yeah. really? it's so weird <laughs> and I, I managed to meet him I, I say managed to meet him I've met him about 10 times let's not spend too much time on that um, I did say when I met him I couldn't believe how good his accent was so he gave me a little bit of the British accent when I met him and I just tried not to melt into a puddle um oh, yeah he's awesome and he did that really well because I had the same problem of setting my book in America. I was like, I really need to make sure that I don't mess this up. So I got people to read it. But there weren't any bits where I went, that's not British. Like, that's not Spike. You did that really well. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, and I would tell you to, you know, I'd be honest. Um, so how did it happen? I asked Kendara Blake the same question when um, she got to write in Every Generation. Not at all jealous of you. you know. <laughs> if the Disney Hyperion are watching this, you know, I 
I was very interested. Um, but yeah, so how did it happen for you? Because Kendara, I think, said that she was about to have a break and she was ready for the first break in like five years. They asked her to write a Buffy book and she was like, okay, no break. <laughs> I'm just going to write a Buffy book. Yeah, and oh my gosh, she killed it. It's such an amazing work. Yeah. Uh, the generation was so good. She clearly clearly got the feel of, of what Buffy is and then her new characters are, are a delightful addition. Uh, my yeah, thing about... Well, yeah. Just a, a weird, so publishing is a small world that once once you've sort of gotten in and you start to know a couple of people, you find it that, you know, oh, like that person that I just met is also connected to this other person. Uh, it's actually a very small world, uh, which is both good and bad. I mean, if you if you make somebody angry, then you're likely to, to wind up making enemies in multiple places all at once. And, and just the same, if, if you're a good person, it turns out that comes around in good ways. Uh, but there was a, a woman working for Algonquin Young Readers, who's been my, my publisher for almost all of my books, all of my books except for Bloody Fool. Uh, and uh, her name is Hannah, Hannah Almond, and she was just an intern, I think, uh, for a little while when Jacoby first came out, uh, and then wound up working for Disney Hyperion when they were starting to look for authors for these works. And so Jacoby is a series set, turn of the century, there's a lot of paranormal elements to it, it's about a, a detective that can see supernatural mythological creatures, and, and so his assistant tells the story. Uh, and so this idea of like capers and zaniness and, and paranormal stuff happening in a vaguely Victorian setting, although mine was was the US, uh, fit pretty nicely. And and she, uh, I, I don't know if she had been aware that I'm a Buffy fan already or not, or if she'd seen any of my interactions online, but said, no, you came to mind for this one. Is this something you'd be interested in doing? And so I got a very cryptic email, right? This is right around when the pandemic was starting. Mm -hmm. Things were weird anyway. We got this very cryptic email saying, hey, if you're interested, I can't, I literally can't tell you anything about it, but it might or might not uh, be something about a certain vampire show uh, that we're looking for some some IP work. Uh, and me, like, I'm like, the only vampire show that I would care for it to be would be Buffy. And if it were Buffy, I would want it to be uh, either a Giles or a Spike store. I think that would be fun. That uh, is so cool. Oh my God, Anthony Head is <laughs> so You uh, got the right one though. Like, can you imagine right. say gone, okay, you can do Buffy, but it's the character you like the least. Like, right, you right, know. Yeah, so it's, it's a Riley story, but like, oh, <laughs> I'll pass. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I think I'd still do it actually. But, right, yeah. that's, fair. that's fair. I wouldn't right. be able to suffer a lot. How about that? We'll we'll write this story and he will fall down. Uh, <laughs> but no, so uh so then finally I, I had to sign a non-disclosure agreement. It was all you know the Mickey Mouse head at the top of all these documents. Uh and and it and it was in fact, of course, the, the spike idea and the, the the pitch for what they wanted me to write was basically said hey you're not signed on you need to prove yourself but we want you to write a pitch and a sample for a turn of the century spike book basically it was spike is in london it's you know it's right after x x period so you know angelus has left uh and beyond that figure it out uh and so i, I came up with the, the storyline, a basic concept for it, the, the main main plot points that I wanted to play with, themes that I wanted coming up in it, and wrote uh, a first chapter, and most of which is, is still in there as the first chapter. A lot of it gets changed along the way, but basically wrote that first chapter and just a little bit more, and sent that in, and they didn't hate it, so they, they said, yes, we, we'd love to work with you. Multiple shifts happened along the way, but it, it meant that I got to got to spend most of my, my sort of quarantined time uh, binge watching Buffy and Angel and and writing stories about bumbling vampires. It was delightful. That is so cool. That is one way to make the pandemic slightly yeah. less <laughs> arduous to writing a secret Buffy book. Yeah, um, always hard to see. And just certain things about Joss Whedon were, were coming out at that time also that yeah. made me just absolutely furious. Like this, this is my chance to play in this and we're finding out all of this kind of stuff about you. So it was that was that was obnoxious as well. Yeah, uh, it made me all the more appreciative of of all of the other creators that helped make that universe so spectacular. Yeah, I mean, my take on that is what you just said. Um, James Masters, somebody asked him about that in an interview, and I'll always quote James Masters, um, and he said that isn't the only creator that was involved. Like everyone from yeah. me to other writers to other directors, um, he just was really dignified about it and said, you know, don't write the whole thing off because there's one person. And I think that that's, you know, it's difficult, isn't it, when that one person is so in integral to something. Um, yeah. Um, on the subject of your Spike book, um, I, I mentioned to William before that it's one of those things that you hear that there's a new Buffy book coming out and you're like, oh, amazing, but also, oh, no, it could be, you know, it could be a really good attempt at a Buffy book or it could be the best thing and you feel like you've got another episode of Buffy. And that was definitely the case where it just felt like you'd written a new like short spike mini series that just slots in somewhere. It was brilliant. Um, how did it feel to 
have your carve out your little place in the Buffyverse and kind of connect us to that. How did you do it? Like, how did you make it feel so Buffy? I'm I'm glad you thought it felt it felt very Buffy. I was, it I was really did. Yeah. In it to begin with, uh, like I said, I was binge watching episodes and getting that that voice in my head right beforehand. Uh, it wound up being easier than I thought that it would. I thought that writing somebody else's IP would wind up feeling very restrictive. Uh, that I you know I bump into walls and want to do things and not be able to uh, far more often. And I think if I were writing, like poor Kendara is writing things that are, are now established and need to follow rules and people are in certain places. And that, uh, whereas mine mine was set a little further back in a, in a point of time where everything is very hazy and misty and I could, I could have a lot more leeway. Uh, but what I found was rather than struggling because I, you know, I didn't know how the magic worked or anything, it's pretty well established how things work in the Buffy universe. You know, the, the rules around when, you know, when vampires can enter and, and you know, places that they can go and places that they can't and that sort of thing. Uh, and when I'm writing my own stuff, I actually find it's, it's a little harder because I've made rules, but the only person who knows those rules is me. And the only place that I mentioned it was on, you know, page 112 of, of a third book. And I have to go hunting through and finding that thing. Uh, whereas with the, the Buffy verse, not only is it a little more on the surface, but also there are millions of different fan sites and things like that on there where I can find timelines and I can check and double check and cross-reference and things. Uh, and so that wound up being very useful. I was, I was on lots of different sites where I was you know, finding information about like what was happening at this exact time. Do they eventually reconnect again? And so I could, I could check myself before you know, mentioning something that couldn't possibly be because you know, timelines. Uh, so that actually wound up being easier than I, than I thought that it would be. Uh, I did... I did run into the, the sort of the, the tough decision of uh, content that the Buffyverse obviously has a lot of blood in it. There's a lot of, these are monsters. They, they mean to be monsters. They intend to be the bad guys. They don't want to be the good guys. Uh, but of course they are the main characters of this story. So you don't want them to be entirely bad for this story. So I, I ran into the mix of, do I show these, you know, the, the grisly murders and you know, Spike looking up with blood dripping down his face kind of stuff. Do I, I mention? And so I wound up doing more of that in mention and it was just sort of this this sort of it's happening just off frame the camera's going to pan over here a little bit and focus on this other thing uh and and going back and forth i kind of i knew uh one way or another if i if i put a lot of gore a lot of that sort of you know the sex and the, and the blood and the violence into it i'd wind up with a little more complaints about oh this isn't why appropriate and if i if i leaned too far the other way and he wasn't you know there wasn't any murders or anything i'd get more complaints about that oh you know he's, he's too soft he needs to be because he is he's vicious during this time period uh so it was it was tricky finding that balance in a way that felt satisfying to me but ultimately i hope uh, i hope I, I walked the line in a way that uh, that worked for everybody you did uh, but mostly it was it was a, it was a joy to just jump into the world yeah, I can tell. I think you can tell when somebody really loves what they're writing and really knows it. And I think Spike's voice is so distinctive and I could just hear, I could hear the lines being spoken by all the characters, which was amazing. And it was interesting to see Darla a little bit because she's one in the Buffyverse. I could have, in Buffy, I probably could have taken all that left her, but then in Angel, you got to know her a little bit more. And I think that you did that well, that you kind of, you gave all of them depth. And Drew Silla as well can be a, a bit of an odd one. I love her, but I know some people find her a bit odd because she is. Um, and I liked the fact that without giving too much away, it felt like you explained a few things in Buffy that I'd always been curious about. You got to kind of, did you get to make those things up or? I did. I wasn't sure if they were going to pull me back on it. Uh, there's little, little details. Like she's, yeah, she's got her doll that Miss Edith that she yes, carries around. That's the her. thing I'm referring to. I loved that. I loved how you dealt <laughs> yeah. with that. It was very clever. Yeah. And I, I looked through the, the series. I put, that was ironically pouring through the series and online and everywhere to find any other mentions of, of Miss Edith and where she came from and any explanations. And, uh, and there weren't. So I, I, I'm going to jump in and, and play with this one. Uh, and there, there were things everyone's, I, I'd send something back and I'd get feedback saying, Oh no, you, you can't do this. Uh, no pushback on that one. I was happy, happy to, to play with her. Uh, one that I did get frustrated me the most because it is, it's in canon, uh, there are already some conflicts because uh, vampires can't breathe. They don't have lungs. And that became a very important, or they, they have lungs, but they don't have breath in their lungs. Uh, and that became an important sticking point because there's a moment when Angelus can't give CPR. And so there's this whole justification for why no, absolutely no breath passing back and forth in vampires. And yet you regularly watch Spike take a puff on a cigarette and blow smoke out. And think, like there's, there's things where there's definitely obviously breathing happening. You and kind of like, need to breathe to talk as well. Oh, yeah, so. Voices, right. Uh, and so I, I had one of the drafts, I had a, an amazing copy editor, no, no insult to him, uh, but he came through and it was like three comments per page. Whereas anytime it's like, you know, uh, 
Oh, I, you know, I can't deal with it. She breathed. And it's like, no, no, she didn't. Like, yes, she did. She That's that's a, an intonation issue there. Yes, she breathed it out as a way of speaking. So like uh, every every sigh, every breath, every you know, gasp, things like that. I got a little note of like, but did they really? And I had to like every, there was maybe two of them in the entire thing where I said, okay, maybe, maybe she didn't hold her breath because, okay, fine, she can't. But uh, things like that, that were the really nitpicky details. Uh, every once in a while, I'd get a kickback on that. Um, but all of them, got, I was I was happy to get the feedback because it's good to have someone else watching out for that. I don't want, I don't want you know, spike somebody and have them turn into you know something other than dust or something like you don't you don't want to do the wrong thing in a Buffy series and have fans go no no they didn't. Yeah, I was thinking that there is pressure, isn't there? When some people love something so fiercely, there's not many things out there like that. Like I guess like Star Wars, Star Trek, Buffy. Right. There's certain things that the fans will tell you if <laughs> you've misquoted or mis <laughs> misspoken. Has anybody without you know? putting anybody down um, has anybody said to you i think you'll find that on page seven line <laughs> two you 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 know you were inconsistent with buffy this is anyone like said other that? than my copy editor who said that on every page uh no i don't i don't think i've gotten that that was uh, really good i've seen a few comments of people who who wanted either more or less of the of the violence but other than that no I don't know. I get that with romance. Some people want a YA book, as you probably feel, with um, with no romance at all, like no kissing, please. And then some people are like, can it just be all kissing and no vampires? Have you ever met a teenager? Like they they say naughty words. They occasionally do the sex thing. Yeah. Yeah. Some people didn't like the fact that there was there's alcohol in mine. Right. It's terrible. <gasps> I know. That's weird. Yeah. Like alcohol peripheral teenagers, and they're just like, she can't be in a bar. She's a teenager. I'm like it's New Orleans in the nineties. She can kind right. of anywhere oh. she wants. <laughs> um, anywhere at all, I checked. Um, New Orleans in the 90s, there was a particular like couple of years, funnily enough, when my book is set, where the rules were a little bit flex, um, and there was kind of a loophole where teenagers could kind of go into places like, we're going to take that loophole and go with it. So yeah. I did get a few comments about that and have to bite my tongue and not go, actually, I think you'll find in this particular law, right? <laughs> there is a provision that you could exploit if you so chose to do. But yeah, yeah there'll I... always be people that say stuff like that, won't there? I, I guess. I... I set my own uh, my own series in a fictional town. It's in New England, but it's it's a fictional town called New Fiddleham. Uh, and, and I did that because I wanted the freedom to be like, oh, actually, you know, goat herding wasn't wasn't common in, in Boston or whatever. And I'd be like, well, it was in my town. Like I can I can have that argument because it's it's made up. Uh, it's a little trickier with London. I looked at so many archaic London maps. Oh my goodness! Like making sure that I got the streets right. There's even um, uh, there's an important street to, in in the series, which street, uh, which is still there in the you know form of Aldrich Street. There is, there is one little area, but it got destroyed uh, and no no big spoilers, but you know, by, by the end of my book, there are bad things happening that may in fact be, be the reason for it, it not being there now. Uh, and so the like little things like that, I, I wanted to make sure that I, I pinned down perfectly and making sure that, like, if he comes around the corner, what street is he coming from and things like that? Will anybody care? Absolutely not, but I wanted to make sure that I got it right. It's so much easier to just make it up and say, like, that's that's what it is. It's yeah, it easy. is, but I think it shows taking that care of the details because there might be that person that it pulls them out of the reading experience and you obviously, you want to do it really well, don't you? Um, right. That links to something else I was going to ask you. So you've written, am I right in saying you've written nine books so far, uh, which is amazing. But, yeah. you know, I can only hope to get to that point. I'm on two currently, so. It's, it's good. One is an achievement, two is great. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, So you've written series and you've written standalones. Do you have any advice, as somebody who's right in the middle of her series um, now, what would you say is the kind of, the way to get through a series in one piece? Yeah, uh, I, when starting my first one, I had general ideas about where I wanted to go. And so I had sort of the the very, very big plot point with with nothing but mist in between. Uh, starting <laughs> The, the, uh, the there's the sort of plotters versus panthers <laughs> competition in publishing. Uh, I tend to be more of a plotter. I tend, you know, I'm an English teacher, so I, I write out my plots in you know, Roman numerals and letters and the whole whole deal. Oh wow, that's awesome. I, that's and that's useful for my brain. Yeah. Uh, but one of the things that I did find, because one, you know, I'm four books into a series and I'm I'm, I'm struggling to to feel the the motivation. Uh, I wrote a blog post about this years ago. Uh, was I, I called it effort zombies that you get to a point in a book where you're like I know where I'm supposed to go there's the path it's right there and this is I am how many hundreds of thousands of words into this series and I'm bored and if I'm bored I'm not feeling the energy in it uh, and you know writers like Neil Gaiman is that like you know there's things that feel inspired and things that feel like you're pulling teeth to write it and the readers don't know in the end because you polished it and looks good uh, but I was just as I was writing this I'm like I am so bored with this I know my readers are going to be bored with it too 
And so rather than slogging through and writing like three words a day because I wasn't feeling it, uh, instead I said, okay, you know, I'm just gonna write F it. I'm gonna write what I want and make this seem more interesting to me. And so I introduced zombies into a book uh, that I had, I had run the pitch by my editors already. I had approval, I had, I had you know, money. I'd been paid for a book that did not have any zombies in it. And this became this sort of this big side, side okay. plot to the story because I just wasn't feeling it. Uh, and that wound up getting the energy back up. And so by the time I was done, uh, with that scene, we could have cut the scene in the end and it would have been fine, but at least I had gotten past that hump. I had done a thing that felt passionate again and it had gotten sort of that, that vim and vigor back into the writing. Uh, and there are scenes, I, there, there are scenes that I wrote that were like that, that I was feeling a little bored and so I wrote something cheeky that did wind up getting cut out. And I kind of knew even while I wrote like, this is great and I know my editor's gonna tell me I need to get rid of it because it's not you know, in keeping with the, with the tone or whatever. Uh, and I wrote those anyway, because you gotta, you've gotta keep the energy and the joy in what you're doing. Uh, so I guess that, that would be my big advice is that it's useful to have the plot. If you're a seat of your pants writer, give yourself the plot because it's helpful to have trail markers up that mountain. Uh, but even if you've got those, it's also it's also good to go by the seat of your pants and remember that that's fun and that there's joy to be had in what you're creating. Yeah, I think I'm a trail markers, but also going off piste and like taking a real wander and having some murder and then coming back to the actual path. That's me. <laughs> a light just, murder on the side. Murdered, yeah. yeah, just light extra murder that I didn't know was going to happen and I, I think that that gives me some of the joy I also went with the Scream 2 thing how a sequel because I'm writing slasher type books yeah. but the death scenes have to be bigger um what does he say the body count has to be bigger the death scenes have to be more elaborate so I kind of kept that in my mind so wow. this book I had the second book had like three climactic scenes at the end and I was like what am I gonna have to do in the third one like is it just going to be all climactic scene and no, no right well, this, this raising the stakes is is always the, sort of the, the issue. Like, oh, in, in this one, we're, we're saving the person. In this one, we're saving the town. In this one, we're saving the world. And it gets bigger and bigger. Yeah. Uh, but one of the things that I think is important to keep in mind is you could you could blow up an entire world and nobody will really care. I mean, just just ask like Douglas Adams, Hitchhiker's <laughs> yeah. Guy. We, we start off the, the series blowing up the world and nobody really feels bad about that. We feel bad about, you know, the characters who are now dealing with it. That's very uh, true. Just, Stakes are more about you know personal investment in things. Yes. So sometimes the trick is really like uh, in I'm, I'm writing now the fifth book in the Jacoby wow. trilogy cool. uh, is is sort of it's sort of a standalone on its own. So Rook is is a story that takes place sort of af after the main st main storyline in the first four books. Uh, and with that one, the you know the stakes are not as big in that way. There there are some large stakes, but the the character is dealing with heavier emotions and things that are a little more complex. It, it you know brings in family issues that weren't in the first four. And so even if the body count might be lower, or there you know there are fewer people are going to die if such and such isn't solved, it's still got this sort of the importance to her is is higher. So the stakes can be bigger in a different way. Yeah, that's a really good point, actually. I sometimes do get a bit fixated, I think, on the big and bloody things because that's the kind of, they're the key plot points that the book sure. is hinged on. Um, but yeah, it's good to think about the emotional journey as well because I think a lot of people like that when I, um, like when they're reading a book like ours, like, you know, like the Spike book, there's all the, the big things that happen, the big things, but then it's actually the little moment between Spike and Drusilla that I probably enjoyed and how mm -hmm. their relationship develops and cements as the book goes on and yeah. yeah, it's those it's those little bits you get you get the moment. And Buffy was great at this. The whole series was good at this, where you get a big giant, you know, then you know whatever third apocalypse in the series is happening, and you get this little like an just an like an eye eye to eye moment between two characters, and you and you'd be like, okay, apocalypse. Oh, now I'm invested. Like they love each other, they care about each other, and you have just that that little moment really sold the scene rather than the stakes. Yeah, I think Buffy can teach you a lot about writing. Yeah. like books as well as writing TV shows because it's just got everything, hasn't it, in terms of okay. the drama and the genuine relationships and the found family. I think a lot of way authors probably consciously or not have drawn on that sure. when they're sure. writing. And consciously in your case, when you're writing actually in the Buffyverse. <laughs> um, so let me check. What was I going to ask you? Because as usual, I've gone completely... <laughs> you know, around, in, around in exciting circles, but still circles. Um, so I... Obviously, I didn't know much about the Jacoby books. I'm definitely going to read them. Um, but obviously, there's the historical thread between, like, in the historical time periods um, that you wrote in for Bloody Fall for Love and then in your other books. Um, is there anything else that you think that if you look across your books that are common kind of themes or ideas that you tend to play with? Uh, I, identity is a, is a big one, and that's, that's kind of a very general term. I think that comes up in a lot of YA. 
Uh, and it's one of the reasons I love writing YA is that it's it's a time period when people are finding themselves in a, in a big way. Uh, you're you're meant to go through this developmentally. You're meant to go through this. You know, I'm, I'm a goth this week, and I'm you know bubblegum punk this week, and you're all all, all over the place. Uh, and that's very healthy, and it's okay. Uh, and so having characters go through that, there's sort of the, the classic buildings roaming, you know, the the loss of innocence, all of those those things that come up, are because that's what kids are doing between roughly the ages of you know 11 and 21 is they're completely melting into their cocoon and becoming this new beautiful butterfly. Uh, and so I like that. I like the idea of uh, characters exploring who they are and trying to find, you know, feeling like they know who they are and then being wrong and being willing to adjust and be something slightly, slightly different. Uh, and so that definitely comes up in a lot of my stories. Uh, with Jacoby, a lot of it was about the, the self-confidence of the narrator. Uh, her name is Abigail Rook. And so she's, she's wanting to be this adventurer and she's, she's living at a time when women are being told, you know, you, you need a man to cross the street. You, you need, you need somebody else uh, to, to, even just function in society. Uh, whereas she looks at, at people who are in the world like Nellie Bly and like the, the real explorers in the world who are awesome and doing cool things. Uh, and she's like, I wanna be that. I wanna be like my dad and, and you know, discover new things. I wanna, you know, I wanna be cool. I don't wanna care about titles and things like my mother does. Uh, and so she goes off and goes on this adventure. So a lot of it is about her building her confidence to, to find who it is that she is. Uh, and in each book, she runs into other strong women. And so that's, that was a big intentional point of, of picking out a variety of different role models for her as she goes through that process. Uh, uh, does she meet real historical figures then? Uh, not not real historical figures, although some of them are, are based on some, okay. some historical figures. That's interesting. Uh, there is, there's a Nellie Fuller, for example, who's, who's based on largely on Nellie Bly and, and Elizabeth Fuller. Uh, so there, there, there are a few people that I've sort of made amalgams of history, but like I said, I wanted to to very intentionally make a fiction that was, uh, yes. that was allowed to be a little more loosey goosey. Uh, and then, so in the uh, the Odd Myers, all about two boys who discover themselves, and it's it's uh, dealt with a lot of adoption themes. One of my children is biological, and the other is okay. adopted, and so there were a lot of themes about making sure that you know that you you belong, that you're part of part of a group, and that's forever. Family is forever, and it's not just about blood. And so identity, uh, family meant a lot to that. And then of course Spike, he feels like he knows who he is, and I think often he doesn't. That he's got certain certain qualities that he knows. Like I'm big and I'm bad and I'm tough, and he wants to be that. Uh, and we, as the as the reader and as the viewer, know that also you're you are a giant Romeo softy, like you're romantic, and that's a part of who you are, even if you don't realize that that's who you are. And and also you are this sort of oddly like loyal, like you've got these these qualities that you try to pretend that you don't have. Uh, and so he's he's trying to play a part that he thinks he's supposed to be, even though he's not really doing it right. And so the things like being there for Drusilla, he thinks he needs to be the strong guy when when really he needs to just be the person who cares about her. Uh, so little things like that about sort of picking out your identity. Uh, and shapeshifters, oddly, that's that's something that also seems to come up in all of my awesome. stories. People who literally change shape. So uh, so I don't know if there's there's a connected. You know, let Freud in on that one, but uh, I was just thinking that that sounds that sounds quite connected. Um, and I, I just it just occurred to me actually as you were talking then that you are writing about adult characters in Bloody Fall for Love. What was that like? Because obviously a lot of your readers are going to be adults, like the Buffy fans, like me. Um, well, some of them will be twelve or thirteen. So how did you navigate that? That they they are kind of, I like to think of me as they are relatable issues, but some of those issues kind of won't be all that relatable. So how did you navigate that? Yeah, that's another tricky one. That uh, that Jacoby's many of the characters are adults, but the the lead character is at least just becoming an adult, very young. Uh, whereas Spike is is all, all, everyone in in you know that that universe is not only already an adult, but they're then an adult who has had extended years as a vampire being an adult. So they're you know hundreds yeah. of years of them. Uh, the the fun thing about the paranormal side of it is that it allows them to stay stunted. It allows them to stay in that yes. like figuring things out stage. Uh, Spike especially is is very much that sort of brash, you know, trying to try to act the way sort of middle schoolers think, uh, even though he is very much an adult and dealing with adult themes. Uh, the way that his mind works is still oddly formative. He's still making the kinds of mistakes that we tend to make in our, you know, at least in our younger twenties, if if not earlier when we're still developing. Uh, and so it, it, a lot of it came with this sort of playing with even as an adult, you're still figuring things out, and that's all right. Uh, the again the the sort of the, the bigger themes there did it did get into that balance of figuring out how how much adult content am I willing to tuck into this and and where do, where do I keep the camera like it's sort of the uh, the, the YA book tends to have you know two lovers go into a room and then the door closes whereas the adult <laughs> book lingers for a while and then you know stares at what's happening uh, so this was similar like you know, like where do we close the door at what at what point do we pan away 
Uh, and so those kind of questions came in a little more than than necessarily their age or what exactly they're doing. They're still up to the bad stuff, but we're gonna we're gonna watch them as they do the fun stuff, and we'll just mention that they do the bad stuff. Yeah, that's really interesting, and I think it's always something to navigate, isn't it, as a YA author, that you want to be authentic and write to you're writing for a very intelligent, well-read audience. So it's kind of not writing down to teens or thinking that they can't handle it, but just recognizing that that they are teens and yeah. you know some experiences are just not going to be in their range of experience or their interest um yeah. yeah i thought you captured it beautifully and i think that spike and drusilla both have some very kind of childlike qualities don't they and things that they are working through um, i mean drusilla and the dolls like you know yeah. that's going to be some kids are going to be identifying with that because they're not that far out of that period as well um and i'm in some really sad and sweet ways, as much as she becomes a, a comic character and she's funny in some of her quirkiness, she's also an incredibly tragic character. And she has yeah. trauma. She has very real trauma, thanks to all of the terrible, terrible things Angelus did to her. Uh, and so it is, again, walking that line between the, this is not a character who is a joke because she is different, but this is a character who is quirky and strange. And so finding finding that mix, I think a lot of teens connect and relate to that, you know, they, they can have friends who are, or, weird and who are different and that doesn't mean that they're a joke they're they're still no. their, that's still their identity yeah. yeah i think that buffy does that beautifully actually that there's such a range of characters from all different backgrounds um, and you know people could say that in modern times it could even go further um in that way but i do think a lot of the relationships like i think willow was the first time i saw same sex like relationship on tv and it was just right. oh, man. kind of yeah for me because i was 13 12 or 13 when buffy started um so yeah i think that do you, you did it really well adult characters cool. but kind of written in a way way yeah, so, yeah i've love, never done I'd that love before. to see someone uh, take on you know a, a willow story to it as well a backstory yeah. or a child story uh, i would love to see that i would love to see that that i think I'm, I'm not the right voice for that book i want someone else to take it on uh but yeah absolutely i think uh, the two of them were instrumental in sort of showing the world also that you can do this on tv it paved the way for a lot of a lot of modern tv where it's now it's not a thing like whatever they just happen to have a relationship that's not the story here's the story over here uh and i think buffy in, in a big way paved the way for that a little clunky sometimes of course because they're doing new things uh but yeah absolutely i'd love to see uh more of their story explored so whose story would you like to write apart from spikes i know you mentioned giles earlier would he be the one that you'd like to do something i would have fun do? with a job yeah because we, we jump into uh to the you know the giles that we know when he's so older, he, he's oh he's he's the old man, and I'm looking back at it now, and and I think Anthony Head was younger than I am when he started. Oh, yeah, I know. I did think that the last time I watched Buffy, I was oh. like, Giles is now the age appropriate character for me. He's a good looking young man. What are you talking about? Right? <laughs> no. uh, but he, no, so I would love, I would love to see some of sort of his backstory. I'd love to see you know, him when he's still early training. Like obviously, he knows a lot about this world. He's you know, he's done a lot of research into the monsters, and he's researched these books. But also, he's not inexperienced. He knows how to train Buffy to be a fighter also. And so I'd love to see some of that, uh, some of that backstory I think would be a, a, a hoot to play with. Um, I mean, there's there's so many characters that I would, like I said, like, like Tara is a good example. I'd love to see her story, but I'm not the right person to write it. Uh, so there, there's there's all kinds of- I think it's supposed to be a Tara story. I think I might have seen one. I I mean, I've, I've, again, sort of like the the TV reboot. I've, I've heard rumors and not, I've uh, this, this isn't even me being cagey. I, I, I know nothing. I, I've, I've not seen anything conclusive at this point. I would love to love to know more. Yeah, um, I don't know if somebody tagged me in like an Atara cover, but I might be wrong. That I think that mm. could be one of the Disney ones that's coming maybe. Oh, I'd love to see um, that, I'd love to see that one. Yeah, I think Giles, um, because he's got that kind of ripper bit where he just went completely off the rails and then you've got the kind of young watcher Giles, like how those two, Giles is yeah. going to be the one. I think that you could go through that whole his whole journey, couldn't you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's there's all kinds of story there. there there's anchor points. There's things that you know ha had to happen in his history. Yeah. Uh, but the rest again is very sort of in the fog, and I'd love to see that. Yeah, me too. Well, let's manifest this one. I feel like that could be something you'll be very good at. You're very good at the English side of it, so don't anybody yeah, watching this sure. be dissuaded. You can do the English voice, but. Um, I have a few, a few, few English relatives, and I'm always worried running things by them, even more so than than fans in England. Like, 
you know me and you'll tell me exactly like how badly I messed that up. So it's it's good it's good to hear it from from them as well. You can message me now if you need the South Yorkshire perspective. Okay. I can good give you that. Good to know. All right. Just need to get fans like all over the world just that you can tap into. I was really lucky that when the first book came out, I kind of started talking to more people from New Orleans. So I had like one or two contacts for the first book, but now I've got like a whole team where I can go, okay, you told me about vampire law last time, go. That's you sort me out for So yeah, it's really good. Um so we've talked a lot about things that I was going to ask later, um, and you've mentioned that you are more of a plotter um, than a pantser, but we've not really gone into your publication journey. So how did Jacoby come about, like, way back when? What year did it come out? Was that about was that 10 years ago? it released, and I'd been working on it you know, since about 2012. Okay, so how did that happen? Uh, yeah, so I, I guess that's a strange life. Uh, I had, I'm a teacher, and I'd been teaching at the time in a little school in Salem, Oregon. And oh, cool. uh, I uh, worked with a science teacher who was, was delightful, wonderful man named Ryan, who uh, was at the time already doing a tandem class with another English teacher where they were doing some research science and then coming to the English class for sort of the, the written part of it. So sometimes they'd lump both of their days together to do a field trip and other days they'd lump both of them together to have more time for editing or whatever. And so it was this cool sort of combo showing that like, even though we usually rip them apart in school, science and English are not separate subjects. They can belong together in school. Uh, and so by the end of the year, the two of us started talking about the idea of doing like a mystery combined with uh, his, um, what was the title of his class? It was, it was a CSI sort of a class as a criminology sort of class. Uh, and he said, wouldn't it be fun to look at like these, these classic books, uh, like, you know, look at some Sherlock Holmes, look at some Agatha Christie, whatever, and look at these kind of mystery stories, and then also take a look at you know, what would the what would the actual science be behind how they solved these kinds of mysteries, and, uh, and oh, what a, what a fun thing to do. And so I spent a good chunk of time at the end of that year starting to, you know, just rereading, reading a lot of my, my Sherlock Holmes, reading a lot of, sort of my, my classics and, and some, you know, modern stuff, you know, A's for Alibi series, things like that. And, uh, and then budget cuts hit, and I wound up not even being back at that school at all, let alone able to do that that interesting class. Uh, and that year, that summer, as I was sitting at home, all of this stuff had been bouncing around in my head. I had been teaching mythology, uh, and my son had uh, had just turned one. He was this tiny, tiny little thing, and his you know, head lolling around, falling off of the couch, and things like that. And so I would wake up in the middle of the night and you know take care of him because he was crying and my wife was was working on you know regular nine to five and didn't have the summers off like I did. And so I was summertime in charge of all of the nighttime stuff. And so he'd wake up and fall back asleep after a bottle or whatever. And I would just be lying there with my brain humming and not able to fall asleep. And so these ideas of like the the myth combined with the the criminal world started to come together. Uh, and and bit by bit I started writing what was supposed to just be maybe a short story that I would, you know, tell my wife to entertain her. Uh, again, name, named the main character after my, my son. Uh, and so Jacoby emerged as this idea of like, wouldn't it be cool if there was this quirky Sherlock Holmes-esque detective, but what made him special wasn't that he was actually good at what he did. It was just that he had this cheek. He was a seer who could see mythological creatures. Uh, and so in, in some ways that Rook, who's sort of his Watson, is actually better at the analytical side of things than he is in many ways, because she has to be. Uh, and so we, I sort of played with this character and made you know, a, a scene or two, and and my wife was the one to say like, oh, what what happens next? Tell me more. And so I wrote, you know, now it's a couple chapters. Oh, maybe it's a novella. Maybe I'll do something with this. And then eventually, uh, it was a novel, and I had the the complete novel and ideas for what I wanted to even do after that. Uh, and and so with the finished novel, I said, okay, I'm I'm done with it. This is a fun project. I'm going to put it on the shelf, just like every other, you know random crochet project or a random you know, drawing of a duck or whatever. Uh, and my wife again was the one to say like, nope, you're gonna do something with it. Like you, sh you should go, like you should, you should find out what it takes to get an agent. You can find out what it takes to get published. And so uh, I began that whole process, which is, as I'm sure you know, weird. It's not a natural thing that writers are good at. You know, like selling yourself is not a, you know, writers are often introspective, sit by yourself for hours on end in a room. We're not the put yourself out there people. And so I, got a chance to learn how to query and how to pitch and how to, how to sort of sell an idea. And my, uh, my 13th query, I found Lucy Carson, who's, who remains my agent. Absolutely. Oh, awesome. uh, and, and she was the one who reached out and I got a chance to, uh, to decide between editors. There were a few different interested editors. Uh, and Elise Howard at Algonquin Young Readers was the one who ultimately I opted to go with, largely because of uh, the work she had done in the past. She, uh, she worked on a number of, of books that I was very impressed by, and one of, one of my favorites was uh, 
by Neil Gaiman. Um, he wrote the Graveyard Book as well as countless others, but the Graveyard Book in particular, I felt like that's kind of it's it's the right kind of voice. It's, it's it was a little younger than when I was doing, but it, it's that sort of like I like the the darkness combined with the light and the hope. And uh, and Elise has been amazing. She she puts out nothing but good books. Her other authors are also spectacular. Uh, and so that's that's how I got in. And since then, I've largely been writing for Elise. As I mentioned, it's because of that book that I wound up getting the Spike book. So uh, just continue. I'm, I'm like I said, putting out the uh, the ninth comes out this summer, and I'm continuing to boil ideas in the back of my mind for what's after this. Yeah, that's so cool. I think my journey was similar, but it's so interesting to talk to authors. Some will say, "Well, I won the chicken house competition, and I won a book deal, and got an agent." And it sometimes it goes in completely different orders. I had a friend who was about to self-publish a book. And Scholastic, yeah. at the very last minute, like a month before her book was meant to come out, they just bought it and they published it a month later instead. Like, it's so interesting how it's people year, can, yeah. And I think people can either get their big deal as their first book or it can be their, you know, 21st book. Um, yeah. It's just different for everybody, isn't it? And um, it's so not a measure at all of skill or talent. A lot of it is luck. A lot of it is what the market happens to be doing right now. And like, like you said, you might get a huge hit for your very, very first book and awesome that opens doors and gets your people attention to you. Uh, and you might not get published until your seventh book and you feel like, oh, you know, the first six were terrible, but they weren't because that seventh absolutely blows the roof off of that other guy's first. Uh, yeah, it's it's a wild world. And I think it, you don't realize that at every stage there is rejection and at every stage there are difficult things. And quite often it's rejection that you can't even talk about because you get nominated for something that's like, this is embargoed. If you win it, you can talk about it. But if you don't, you can't. You're like, oh, I had that quite early on. And I don't think I'm still allowed to talk about it. Yeah. Um, didn't obviously win it, so can't talk about it. Um, <laughs> it's very strange. And yeah. I think the rejection when you are trying to get an agent is so hard as well because you're so new and you haven't tested your writing against anyone. And the first thing you get is a form rejection, dear author, we are sorry, we do not want your book. And you're like, okay. And then you get another of those and you think, oh, am I doing the wrong thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you get the one that says, I love this. Please send me the rest of it immediately. And you go, oh, God, I haven't written it yet. Quick. Yeah. Um, yeah. So hey, I don't know if you, uh, Hurricane Sandy had hit the uh, hit the East Coast right at the time that my I, I was I was pitching things. Uh, and I got the the joy of when, when I did finally get connected. I was living overseas. I was living in Okinawa, Japan. And so we had like a 16 hour time difference figuring out like I had things I had to plug into my computer and even make a phone call. Uh, and when I did manage to connect to to my now agent, she had literally not even reached running water in the middle of the emergency, having gotten away from a, a, a bad situation before oh, she had, had a friend reach out to me because her internet also wasn't working, of course. Uh, and so that was one of those like the, the un, unbelievable weird circumstances of, of her reaching out to me, showed me like, yep, you're somebody who's going to fight for my book. And, and you're so Yeah, who, she really so. cared if all that was going on and you were still a priority. And that's right? oh, I can't even imagine. Yeah. She's, yeah. she's worked with some amazing people also. Yeah, well, I'm including yourself obviously she obviously has good taste like your editor it's it's definitely a pattern isn't it you can tell that somebody is really good when they've got this great agent and great publisher so you know never oh, sell yourself amazing. short thank you okay so we've been sensible i'm going to do some quick fair questions which i've not prepared you for so i want real yeah. answers i may interrupt you if i disagree we are talking <laughs> book here, so it's important it's funny i always say quick fair and then people are like okay let me give me my 10 minute dissertation on why angel is superior so feel free to do that as well okay right. are you ready Let's um go. buffy or faith uh buffy i go buffy Okay, correct answer. <laughs> no, I'm not, like I'm not no all your answers. Like, which would you rather have a coffee with? Yeah, which would I just you think, you know, a yeah, no context. You've just got to decide <laughs> the context. Um, and I won't grade all of your answers. That just is an important one. Um, <laughs> Spike or Angel? I feel like I might know the answer already. I mean, Spike. Spike. Angel or Angelus? Angel. I mean, for sure, Angel. Uh, God, see, I, I do want to give, like, I want to add more. Okay, tell me, me, tell me, give the reason. I mean, Angelus is certainly like, the existence of Angelus makes Angel more interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, be, between the two, it's Angel versus Spike. Uh, both of them are terrible choices for Buffy to end up with. I'm going to get lots of hate for that. Uh, but for for like as somebody who mentors teens, they're both bad boys. You don't want to be with either of them for so many reasons. Uh, but between the two of them, the fire chemistry that James Marsters brought to that character makes it impossible not to 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 sort of lean toward him as much as I. Uh, I love Angelus, or, or, uh, Angel, much as I love Angel. Um, that character was much more reserved, and that was the point. That was the whole point. But it was it was a very brooding character. Uh, whereas uh, whereas James Marsters was the worst choice, but was just fire. He was he was so exciting. 
Um, and the same, so, but with, uh, with Angel versus Angelus, Angelus is so awful. He was so good at being bad. Uh, but then when you then jump back to him being Angel, all of that brooding suddenly feels like more justified. You get to like, yes, that you should feel bad. You should be brooding. You should feel awful about what you did. So, uh, so I like the depth that Angelus uh, brings to Angel. Yeah, good answer. I really shouldn't ask that question because you do kind of need one without the other. Okay, controversial, least favorite Buffy character. Riley, with very little hesitation. Uh, of, of the main cast, because if I'm going to get any hate at all, I'm going to keep adding on. Uh, of the main cast, Xander is also really hard to like. And... Uh, but he's also he's he's really fun to hate. It's it's where you're at the point where like I wouldn't get get rid of him in the series because like him being obnoxious is part of what makes you love the other characters when they yeah. hate on him. Like it's it's yeah. it's a love hate relationship. And also, I think knowing something about the actors as well sometimes colors how I feel rewatching Buffy. It's sometimes like also, you hear yeah. you hear stories and it kind of judges them, like changes yeah. how you feel about people. Um, absolute favorite Buffy character. Mm. That's hard also. Uh, I love Willow for her sweetness. I like If there was a character that I wanted to spend time with, it would probably be Willow, even though she made some of the worst, darkest mistakes when she goes dark Willow. Um, but in general series, Willow. Uh, but I again, not that he's a good person, but Spike probably just for, for depth of character, for the, for the number of different things that he does for me narratively, I, I, think, I think Spike. Good answer. Also the same as mine. Um, favorite Buffy season? I can't answer this one, so I don't know why I'm asking you. It's so mean. You. Um, I probably God, that's hard. A lot of my a lot of my favorite things happen in season four, even though season four is not my favorite season. Uh, I might even go as as weird as it is. I might go season one, even though. It probably has the fewest of my individual like favorite episodes. The quality of, of film wasn't as good. The quality of acting honestly wasn't as good, but it introduces so many absolutely pivotal elements and does so it, they're, they're throwing stuff at the wall even more uh, in season one uh, in ways that even though technically I think it's probably the worst season and it should be because it's the first and they get better as they go. Uh, it's got more things in it that I like, as I was doing my binge, felt more at home to me just to be like be back in this in this world with the early early stuff because the potential was all still there and it could have gone anywhere at the beginning uh, and i love where it went but i think i might go weirdly season one yeah that's a good answer and i think the way season one starts where darla is climbing into like break they're breaking into school aren't they darla and a boy and she's like yeah. oh we could get into trouble like you know <gasps> what's that noise and then she's the noise and it's just it's genius. Like I think that that two minutes tells you exactly what kind of TV show it is going to be. That you're never going to know where you stand with it. Yeah, it's going to rip your heart out when you least expect it. It's going to introduce a sister that didn't exist to make you okay with it. You know, right? Yeah, and we're just pretending like everybody knows. Wait, what? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's it's awesome, isn't it? Okay, I had another one and I've just forgotten. Oh yes, okay, last one. Favorite episode? Mm. Or you can have a top three if you wish. <laughs> I do, yeah, I mean, Fool for Love obviously has been has been up there. I like that one even even before I got uh, got hired on. That's the one that I've seen now the most. Uh, but it has elements in it that I like. Uh, it's got the backstory, so you get all of the you know Spike in in London stuff. Uh, but also, it's got that moment in it where you see Spike has at this point been chipped, so he's unable to harm human beings. But also, he's he's especially furious at Buffy in that moment. He's decided he's going to bring the shotgun with him and just you know pull the trigger. It'll take one moment. She'll be dead. He'll probably be destroyed for you know a month or maybe a year, but at least he'll get over it and and it'll be done and over with. And so he's showing up and he's angry and he gets to the uh, to the house. And Buffy is on the porch looking sad. And it's like, he sets the gun down and sits down next to her. And he can't not. Uh, and it's that wonderful element of his sort of toxic romanticism that he can't not do whatever the romantic would do in that moment. He is the, the Romeo. And, you know, you get, you know, Romeo and Juliet begins with Romeo absolutely, you know, zonked out over his head over, over Rosalind. And he can't possibly get over her. And then literally hours later, he can't possibly think of anyone but Juliet. Uh, and how appropriate that Juliet Landau plays his his Drusilla, that he's, yes. he's been absolutely in love with Drusilla, can't get over her. And that's that moment, that scene is when he realizes that like, he's now switched from his Rosalind to his new Juliet. And, uh, and that I think is such a beautiful piece of writing and superb piece of acting uh, for on, on both of their parts. Uh, other than that, so that that was, that's gonna be probably my top one. I like the goofy ones. Like I, I like playing with, 
a story that can take itself seriously and keep a straight face even while doing something ridiculous. Uh, so I might go, uh, I think we mentioned this even before we started, I might go once more with feeling. Yeah. Uh, which is, it's the musical episode. You, you get this this sort of, you know, ridiculous, very, very loose premise of here's a demon who does showmanship stuff. Here we go. And then, and then it's everyone singing. Uh, so many TV series have tried to capture that lightning in a bottle and failed that it's, it's painful sometimes to watch them try. Uh, I love the series Lucifer, beautiful uh, series. And they tr they tried to do their Once More With Feeling episode. And it was just like, oh, dear lamb, no. Like, you, you can't pull this off the same way. I've never seen one where it's actually added something emotionally oh and given a richness. Like, without spoiling it too much, the bit right. where Buffy kind of has been holding stuff back and then just bears her soul in front of all the friends because yes. she can't not sing about her feelings. Like, yes. it's chilling. When I was at uni in my last year, okay. it was really difficult. Like, my husband had gone to work by this time, so I kind of felt a bit on my own. And I watched that episode like probably once a week just to kind of make me feel better. And I rewatched Buffy probably five times that year. And sometimes I did a spike rewatch where I just watched bike episodes or I watched it chronologically from the beginning. And I don't know, it's just, I think you're really lucky to be part of this because Buffy is just such an important thing. So many people, like it's not just a disposable thing, like it's a part of people's childhood and people's teenage years and adulthood in my case, as you can you know, see from the Buffy area. <laughs> It was a shelf. It's kind of just become. It's gonna be a Buffy room at some point. Buffy wall. It's a Buffy room. Yeah. yeah the stuff in the it's loft. Which, like I have a Buffy chess set and Buffy board games and things. I think I even have like a Buffy kind of um like role playing game which I haven't looked at for a long time. But it's it's all up there. Um, Love it. So I'm gonna kind of wrap it up there. I just realized this might be one of the longest interviews I've ever done, but. I don't think I've ever talked to as many people, maybe you and Kendara are on a level, um, people who love Buffy as much as I do. So it's really lovely that I don't begrudge you to the least and that is saying something that you've got to write these books because you obviously really care and it shows in the books. Thank so you. thank you for that. Um, and thank you for coming on. So I hope everybody has enjoyed that as much as I have. I knew I'd love talking to you about Buffy and about your books. Um, I do hope like me that you're gonna immediately buy all the other William Ritter books um, because Jacoby sounds amazing as well. And just hearing, about the fact that you obviously work with teenagers and know a lot about what you're talking about kind of makes it even more important to read these books so let's do that um so thank you everyone for watching thank you william again for joining us hopefully you will stay with me for future episodes i've got lots more vampire involved people i don't know how i keep doing this getting all these great vampire authors wanting to come and talk to me um but i do have um, an interview lined up with the author of in nightfall suzanne young is coming on soon um so stay tuned for that in the near future. And um, so thanks everyone for watching. Thanks, thanks so much for having me. You next time. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>